our next speaker is uh, Associate Professor Rhonda Stewart. Uh, Rhonda's Head of Infection Control at uh, uh, Southern Health, Monash Health now, it keeps changing its name. Uh, we recently did an audit in our own hospital of hand hygiene in our emergency department and the re results were, Anne, 23% I think, something appalling, absolutely disgusting. Uh, and I think many of you will know that emergency departments are one of those difficult areas. And uh, Southern Health are under uh, Rhonda and the leadership in their ED department have done quite a lot of work on this and we see the emergency departments as a key focus for the coming 12 months. It's one of those different areas where they think they're different. It, firstly, everyone must get keftriaxone even if they've just got a headache. <laughs> but I don't mind if they get keftriaxone as long as they hand hygiene. So here's Rhonda. Thank you. Thanks, Lindsay. So we're using uh, we're using the uh, thing here. Oh, okay. So um, yeah, thanks for asking me to come and talk about hand hygiene in the emergency department. So um, I guess the uh, thing we all know about the emergency department is. Uh, it's a busy place um, and it's an essential component of the healthcare system. Um, there's a lot of interface between the public patients and communicable diseases and they're the front line to um, uh, public health emergencies in the emergency department. And we all know too that we're getting increased presentations. There's more and more flow going through our emergency departments every day. Um, and we also have this push to move them out. So we're at Monash, and I presume a lot of other places, we have the four hours is ours. So they're so focused on getting that patient out of the department and, well, and looking after the acute emergencies, the other things such we, as we consider really important, such as antimicrobial stewardship and hand hygiene, are not um, in, the, in the front of their minds. And we know that it's a major gateway to admission, so about half of all hospital admissions come through the emergency department and bring all their bugs with them. And so, of course, it's a critical care, uh, setting for hand hygiene, but unfortunately it's been sort of not looked at in great detail for many, many years because of all the difficult re um, reasons why it's so difficult. So what are the barriers to hand hygiene in the emergency department? I've already mentioned it's rapid paced, high volume, high patient turnover, patient crowding and parking of patients. We've all seen patients in the corridors in our emergency departments, nowhere near any, any hand hygiene um, bottles to, to clean their hands with. The patients have undifferentiated illnesses, not just like the medical ward or the surgical ward or intensive care even. There's lots of different patients there. It's paediatrics, little babies, elderly patients, demented patients. Um, they have lots of different invasive procedures. Um, they may be delirious, com combative, um, lots of IV drug use, uh, um, difficult patients all, all together, and the resources are becoming more and more limited. And the other issue is there's lots of different healthcare workers. So not only do they have their own teams, but we know that all the other doctors and nursing, well, mainly doctors, come into the emergency department. So they have less ownership about their hand hygiene in, in that area. Um, and there's so much more medical interactions in the emergency department than, than other areas in the hospital. And that might be a really important point when we're talking about hand hygiene because we know that usually when we're out auditing on the, on the wards, if the nursing hand hygiene compliance is up there, then that's going to pull up the rates because usually we don't sort of see many moments performed by medical staff in, in um, the wards. So there's been um, a few papers um, written on um, hand hygiene in the emergency department and actually Elaine Larson seems to have written a lot of them. Um, so she's been doing some, a bit, bit of work in Canada. Um, one of the areas she's looked at is the effect of crowding. So this was done over a couple of months in a Canadian public hospital and they really looked at the effect of crowding but also the, the different healthcare workers' involvement. But interestingly, they published on a, an overall compliance rate of just 29%. So, um, and this is a 2015, so um, obviously if you get a publication that's showing your emergency department rates are so low, then there's a lot of people out there that have even lower. Um, but one of the main factors with um, the um, compliance with hand hygiene was the time to a physician assessment, which just implied that there's a, a higher work load coming through, and if uh, if the work if the emergency department was busier, then people were less likely to clean their hands. 
Similarly, um, the same group did, looked at another emergency department and again looked at healthcare worker hand hygiene in the emergency department. And on univariate analysis, the things that they came up with was that actually working in the night shift actually had an increased hand hygiene compliance, something we haven't found actually. Um, another thing that was also surprising in this is that, um, oh no, the, what well, wasn't surprising, but if you're parked in the hallway, then your hand hygiene compliance was going to be much less than if you're parked in the emergency department itself. Interestingly, in this paper, the physician health um, hand, high care, hand hygiene was much better than nurses. This is the first paper I've seen that. Um, uh, glove use, again, another thing that surprised me, this is the first time I've seen um, hand hygiene better when people were using gloves. Um, but again, they use this um, interesting um, uh, way of recording um, flow and crowding in the emergency department. It was the uh, uh, national emergency department uh, crowding rate. Um, and as the rate of patients coming into the hospital um, and leaving the emergency department increased, then the rate of hand hygiene compliance decreased. And our multivariate analysis, really the crowding was one of the most important reasons why hand hygiene decreased. Um, getting around to the impact of numbers of in, um, moments and interactions with patients, I found this paper quite interesting. So this paper looked at the mean interactions per patient hour by different healthcare workers. And they looked at the surgical, medical, intensive care, neonatal intensive care and emergency department. And um, although uh, the rate of interaction between patients and um, healthcare workers in the department, in the emergency department, was very similar to out in the wards, in the surgical and medical wards. It was, it was about half of that in the intensive care or in the neonatal intensive care. The actual interaction by doctors was much higher than any other part of the hospital. And I think this is something we really have to focus on with the emergency departments, that the doctors have a much more higher interactions in the emergency departments, and hence we've really got to work on their hand hygiene. And similarly, um, overall, the hand hygiene um, moments per patient per hour was similar across the um, medical, surgical and emergency department, but much higher for the physicians than any other part of the hospital. So it's certainly an area to look at. I just did a bit of a dirty look at our um, comparative moments, and this is not compliance, this is moments when we just go down to emergency department. And it, it does seem to be true that we're collecting um, more moments for doctors in the emergency department than other parts of the hospital. Now, anecdotally, I've been told too that in a lot, um, a lot of the times that doctors t tend to turn the, close the curtains around so the auditors can't see what's happening behind the curtain, which may impact sometimes. But uh, and generally, we seem to be seeing more doctor moments in the emergency department than anywhere else in the hospital. Um, this other paper was also looking at um, what, what uh, decreased compliance in the emergency department. And again, it's, if you're a physician, you had lower rates. If you were um, uh, transport, note, noting here, that, however, the, the rates are very high, physician 91%, I actually don't believe that. But if you were a ambulance worker coming in and you weren't somebody who actually uh, was owned in the, in the emergency department, your rates were lower. Again, if you're in the hallway. Um, and in this, as opposed to the other paper, if you use gloves, then your hand hygiene was lower. So the rates of hand hygiene vary, and there are published rates of down, down as low as 10% and published rates as high as 90%, so huge variability. Um, and these variations are attributable to lack of time, these urgent clinical situations, the high patient workload, and again, caring for the patients in, in extreme places like hallways. And, and as I mentioned, the, the literature is minimal and is mainly composed of these quasi-experimental studies. There's no sort of randomised controlled trials. What people have done in the past is looked at, um, you know, putting up posters like we've all done, um, changes to education, um, using touch-free hand sanitizers, giving individual people hand sanitizers. Um, Clinician champions, we've done that in our emergency department, trying to put more champions into the emergency department. I mean, there's really been nothing too different to what we're doing across the whole hospital. But one thing that I'll talk about in a minute is um, uh, an educational program and a workflow optimization 
that sounds interesting and maybe some where to we can work for in the future. So what have we done at Monash? Um, we've really focused on the same strategies that everybody's doing, educational workplace reminders, audit and feedback, administrative support and making sure that there's access to the alcohol-based hand rub across the, the service. I think the administrative support is really important. We had letters from the CEO to the units. We had dons walking around the emergency department making sure people are hand hygiene. Um, but other than that, I don't think we've done anything particularly different to any other health service around Australia, but we sort of called it our bundle. And we actually trying to give ownership to the emergency department. They develop their, their own um, screen savers specific for the paediatric component here um, of our emergency department. And just giving them that ownership too, I think actually in, in, really increases their um, desire to um, improve compliance. So at Monash Health um, in 2009, we had one emergency department that started at 40%, but in our last audits, um, we're sort of getting much closer to the 80%. We have three emergency departments, Casey, Daniel and Clayton. And as you can see, we, we've been consistently targeting them every time. And we have this um, really led by Elizabeth, who I work with, Elizabeth Gillespie at Monash Health. She wouldn't let anybody go. If they got under the target, she would make sure we kept on auditing, auditing, auditing. And so that goes for any of our units across the health service. If, if they fall under, um, they will keep on getting audited until I get above the mark. And again, by healthcare worker again, you can see that the rates, um, medical and nursing compliance is like what's around the rest of the hospital. Doctors always do so much worse. But again, this may be more important in the emergency department as far as rates go, um, because we, we're actually seeing more moments by doctors, but also if doctors are seeing more patients, then the, ra then the rate of spread is going to be also increased. So quickly, I just did a, a quick um, in survey just of the um, emergency department staff earlier this year to see what they thought would help improve their hand hygiene. And um, we got about a 15% response, so that's not bad for a hospital survey, I think. They, they want to actually improve um, their hand hygiene and they think that hand hygiene is important in the emergency department um, and they sort of want to be able to improve. So what did they say? They said that one of the main barriers they see is the access of, to alcohol-based hand rub. That's not surprisingly. The empty bottles that are continually witnessed in the emergency department. Too busy, too under pressure, the time constraints, the high patient volume, the chaotic environment. One of the big issues they see is that the uh, procedures, there's so many procedures that they do, the time they get to set it up, the cannulation, the plasters, the multitasking, the running around, trying to get everything together, um, just decreases their hand hygiene compliance and the unpredictability of patients. So safety has to come first. They can't ignore safety and go to the hand hygiene bottle. They've got to actually make sure that the patients are safe and that they are safe too. We have lots of issues with um, safety issues in, in the emergency department. Um, and the environment, um, moments around the computer become very difficult for them when they're going to and from it all the time. Very few sinks if they need to use a sink and the notes at the bedside become even more of a problem in the emergency department than in intensive care, which already is a huge problem. Um, and then the staff, and the frequent new staff, the changeover of the staff and those staff wandering into the emergency department who really just want to get their patient out or they want to send them home. So that's also a huge issue. Um, so I've really talked about the suggestions, to, they sort of suggested um, ways to improve hand hygiene. They wonder, like lots of areas, wonder, do the five moments fit? Um, should we make it four moments? I must say I've started to say, don't worry about the moments, just do before and after. Just do before and after because they're always come questioning about the five moments. Um, incentives, maybe we should be giving them more incentives different education reminders, just like what Lindsay's been doing. Maybe we should be educating the ED staff very differently to what we're educating the staff on the medical and surgical wards who are always in the one place. Um, and resources are a big problem. They, they certainly need more resources in the emergency department, but they're not going to get them. We know that. So moving forward, um, well, education, we need to work at new ways of educating the um, emergency department staff. We have to find a way of getting access and availability of alcohol-based hand rub to every patient that's in the emergency department. 
I've already mentioned about the five moments. I think they do fit as far as auditing purposes go. It's no busier than the ICU, and we certainly went through all that about whether the five moments are appropriate for ICU. But I wonder whether the education needs to be more simpler for them because they're in such a busy state in the emergency department before and after perhaps is all they need to know about. Um, but the ED is unique in that there are so many procedures and so many physician opportunities in the emergency department that maybe that's something we can focus more on and this work, the idea of workflow optimisation. So this um, paper looked specifically at workflow optimisation in the emergency department and what they did was they audited before, then they brought in the intervention, audited again and then sort of revamped the intervention and, and looked at what they um, the outcome was. And the intervention was really designing um, the, op the procedures and putting in when you hand hygiene into that procedure. So they looked at things like wound dressings, um, when you're taking a blood culture, when you are doing a peripheral line insertion. And by just simply putting these into procedure when you do your hand hygiene, they had a sustained decrease in the amount of hand hygiene opportunities that they had to actually perform in the emergency department. In fact, they halved their number of moments from 2,600 down to 1,400 opportunities by about 56%. So if you don't have to perform hand hygiene as much, then obviously your improvement in your compliance is going to increase. And this is just basically the sort of thing, you know, the patient comes in, you, you hand hygiene, you take the patient to their room and you hand hygiene, you prepare the trolley and you hand hygiene. So very simple things, but they found this very effective. And what they found was that um, they actually decreased the avoidable um, mistakes that happened during the study. So a 70% decrease in avoidable opportunities for hand hygiene, a greater than 60% decrease in using hand rub without an indication, and a 73% decrease in glove use instead of hand rub. Um, and for individual patient care, they decrease the number of hand hygiene opportunities um, for both surgical and non-surgical patients. And so these procedures could be put into all these different activities that occur in the emergency department all the time from day to day. Um, so it's just food for thought about how we could just change these operating procedures. Um, but of course, you know, we need to not get too carried away with this workflow design. It has to be realistic and has to be able to fit into the emergency department life. So I guess Lindsay's talked about his colour grid study and I think this would be an interesting way to move forward as well. We, we, we're getting a group together to look at how we could change um, compliance in the emergency department. Maybe it is changing procedures, um, having standardised operating procedures. Maybe we need to do colour grid with different individuals. Maybe the emergency department people think very different to the rest of the hospital. And actually working with them, I think they do. Um, we've had some amazing changes just by putting in proof by, um, with peripheral catheter line insertions in our emergency department. So I think there is an opportunity to work with them and, and move forward with hand hygiene compliance. So um, I'll stop there. Thank you. So thanks, Rhonda. You've introduced a theme that we're going to follow up on in a minute. But it is, you know, it's very important that we move from of can you name the five moments, which we hopefully we can, but for staff to be thinking about not about which moment they're doing, but they're doing it before and after a procedure, before and after, so building it into the practice. So Rhonda, can you just from your data at, at Monash, what proportion of all your moments do you get a sense, if you were to build hand hygiene around you know, putting in a nasogastric tube or putting in the IV, would that be 60 or 70 percent, do you think, of your, all the moments if, if you just sort of educated around procedures and patient contact? Yeah, oh, I think it would be, yeah. I think the, um, the, the before, and we know that moment two is the one that most people don't do. It's, it's crazy why they don't do that. So I think if we had those much higher, we probably would be looking at 60 or 70 percent. So I think it's a different way of thinking. Any particular questions? Or we'll Thanks very much.